We are going to uh, get started here. Last week I did not finish Genesis, so we have to finish Genesis this morning, and we'll do that quickly, and then we'll dive into Exodus, and I've decided to do Exodus in two sessions anyway, so we'll get... Uh, there's just too much to do in one anyway, so it'll work fine. We'll get uh, we'll get started with Exodus, but we'll finish Genesis today. And we're going to be picking up with Joseph in chapter 37 of Genesis. So if you have last week's study sheet, there's some blanks on there which uh, you can fill in. If you don't have it, I left some in the back. And then there is a, a chart of... Ages, just for reference points that um, I asked you to poke holes in if I got anything wrong there. Um, so it just uh, gives you an overview of Genesis and the ages of the people at various things, uh, various times that happened. So let's dive in. We'll start with the word of prayer and then we're going to take a look at the life of Joseph as we finish Genesis, all right? Father God, I thank you for the opportunity to worship you today in Bible study. We pray that you will open our hearts and minds to the word that you have graciously given to us. Lord, may you help me to, to divide it accurately and not to mess it up or confuse it. And Lord, I pray that each and every person will be better equipped to serve you as a result of being here. And Lord, may you bless the balance of our day as we worship and rest together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so Joseph... Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then Joseph. So a lot of times you'll see Israel refer to the land of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, but then it doesn't say Joseph, but Joseph is the next one in that run. And Joseph is, in chapter 37, he's got a dream, and he says what the dream is to his brothers, and his brothers look at him like, eh, you dreamer. And the fact is, is that Jacob has a favorite son, and you know who that is? Joseph, all right? Now, do you want to know why he's the favorite son? Anybody? His mom. Okay, so Rachel's son, in other words, the preferred wife and the only son at this point, and so we understand why he has that favorite son, but in chapter 37, we see that Joseph is sold into slavery by his brothers to a caravan headed to Egypt. So his brothers decide they're going to kill him. And oldest brother, who would have been responsible, says, oh, let's not do that. And so he makes it look like he was torn apart by a wild animal. And they sell him off to the caravan headed to Egypt. All right, so he is sold into slavery by his own brothers. Number two, Joseph's success and imprisonment in Egypt. So if we read chapter 39, we would find out that Joseph is blessed by God. He has uh, many gifts and abilities, and he ends up basically, he is in the palace doing, he's like the right-hand man, okay? And then he is accused of attempted <coughs> rape by Potiphar's wife, when she was the one that wanted to seduce him, he fled, he left his coat, and she said, the Hebrew is the one that attempted to do this. He is falsely accused and imprisoned. All right, so we find him in prison. Then number three, Joseph interprets the dreams of the cupbearer and a baker in prison. So it talks about in that chapter that the cupbearer for the king, the guy that would test stuff, and the baker both were thrown into jail because they had got crossways with the king. And they both had dreams. Joseph interpreted both of those dreams accurately. The one was restored and the other one was killed. And Joseph then is forgotten still in prison. Then number four, Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dreams of cows and corn and is promoted from the prison to the palace at age 30. So we see here that what happens, Pharaoh has a dream and all of a sudden they go, oh, there was that guy in prison that interpreted my dream. And they called for Joseph. He interpreted Pharaoh's dream and said, there's going to be seven really good years and seven really lean years, as in famine. And so he gives that instruction. He ends up being 
promoted from the prison literally to the palace. And so Joseph's life has some of these in it, big ones, doesn't it? All right? Why do we think that our lives should only be like this? Right? I mean, many times we don't think we should have these problems and dips. And of course, if we listen to your favorite bad, smiley preacher on TV, he'll tell you that you just don't have enough faith if you ever have any dips because life is always a Friday. All right? But it's not true. The fact is, is that life has some of these in it, and Joseph certainly experiences them. Well, what happens is, number five, Jacob, Joseph's father, sends sons to Egypt for grain, and they encounter Joseph. The famine is so great that from all over the place, they are coming to Egypt in order to get grain. Okay, So Jacob sends his sons down there, and what's interesting is when they encounter Joseph, Joseph, of course, recognizes him. Think about it. He had a, a pretty good shot of remembering them, more so than them remembering him with one person where he's looking at a whole bunch, and he goes, ah, my brothers. They didn't recognize him. It had been a, a little bit since I sold him into slavery. And so when you start talking being gone from somebody for a dozen years or so, um, they change. And, of course, she was very young when they sold him into slavery, and now he was you know, at 30 years old. All right, so then Joseph sends them back to get Benjamin. Number six, he sends them back to get Benjamin, his only full brother. Okay, you understand when I make that term of full? As in, mother and father were the same for Joseph and Benjamin. All right, so Benjamin is also the youngest, and also it's important to remember that Benjamin is the only son who's born in the promised land. Okay? So that's an important thing that's going to help you understand when we get to the New Testament. And Paul says this. You want to talk, you want to talk qualifications? Let's talk qualifications. A Jew of Jew, that's me. Pharisee, born of the tribe of Benjamin. Okay, Benjamin is the preferred tribe because it was the tribe born in the promised land. It was looked at in a different way. So I happen to be in Israel most of the time when they are having the celebration of Benjamin's birth, Sarah's death, and they actually, all the Orthodox Jews, head to a point just outside of Bethlehem and they celebrate because it is still revered, okay? So anyway, Joseph sends for his younger brother, Benjamin, to uh, come back with them. Number seven there. Joseph prepares the feast for his brothers, giving five times the portion to his younger brother Benjamin. Okay, I just love this because you just picture this feast, and then there's five times the meat, five times the dessert, five times everything for Benjamin. Just the picture of it is interesting. Now, here's what I know. Here's what I know is that um, I can receive everything that I need all right? And be thankful until I find out that Scare back there has gotten 10% more than me. All right? If you ever had a sibling and you were to split something, you know, the splitting of it, oh boy, it better be exactly right. I used to share sometimes a shake with my sister and she turned blue from from no oxygen, from sucking it down as fast as she could before I would be able to get to it. So it's interesting because what he was doing was saying, I'm providing here for all of you, but I'm choosing to identify, I'm going to give more here. Think about, he was the son who had been given more by his father. And how the boys had responded to him was sold him into slavery. Um, it's almost like he was doing a little test here. Well... Number eight, Joseph reveals himself to his brothers in chapter 45. And I love in verse 24, he says this. He says, do not quarrel on the journey. When he sent them back to get their father, he said, do not quarrel on the journey. I just find it fascinating because families are families. And guess what? A whole bunch of boys on a trip back, there was bound to be some quarreling. And he said, no quarreling on the journey. Then, at number nine there, Jacob moves to Egypt at the age of 130. 
and reunites with his son Joseph. You can imagine the magic of this reuniting. Think about it. Is he had thought that Joseph had been killed because his brothers had brought back his multicolored tunic and put blood on it and said he got ripped apart by wolves. All right? Bears ate him up. He thought he was dead, and now he comes back and he finds out he's alive. Can you imagine that? Um, you know, I'm always fascinated by the fact of um, there's a kid named Jacob Wetterling in southern Minnesota, not too far away from my grandparents where they live. And one day he walked out and he disappeared at age 11 or 12. You know what? His parents still want to know what happened because they do not know. So even today, there is Jacob Wetterling Day in that area, and they remember the fact that some 20-some years ago, he disappeared. People want to know. They want conclusion. But here, Jacob's conclusion is now going to be thrown out, and it's like he is a lot. All right? So you can imagine the joy that was, was evident there. Well, Jacob actually ends up moving to Egypt. Um, Pharaoh, because Joseph is such a wonderful person and leader, and does exactly what he's supposed to do, and God's gifted him, what happens is he is given the opportunity to give really nice land to his father and to the brothers, and Jacob moves there. In chapter 49, number 10, Jacob addresses his family, and Judah receives the messianic promise to come. So the son of Judah is told that the Messiah is going to come through you. All right? And indeed, Jesus is going to be born, and when you trace it back, he is of the line of Judah. And that is where that connection comes. And then in number 11, in chapter 50, Joseph delivers kindness to his brothers after Jacob's death. Now, once he got ready to die, and when he does die, his brothers got really nervous. Because you know what they thought? They thought... What if Joseph is only being kind to us because of our father? And our connection is now gone. And they were nervous about it. And I love, I love what Joseph says because in chapter 50, and I printed it for you, highlighted it on verse 19. Joseph said to them, do not be afraid for I am in God's place. As for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. All right, so what you see here is Joseph acknowledging the sovereignty of God in the fact of the difficulties Joseph had had in life, and they were great difficulties. God had used in order to preserve his people later. All right, so now we flash forward ahead 3,500 years to the cross of Calvary, and what we have is evil people deliberately and willingly killing the very Son of God, perfection in human flesh in Jesus Christ. And they meant it for evil. But God meant it for eternal good, for all of those who he would change their <coughs> eternal destiny and provide literally life beyond compare. So this picture of Joseph and his willingness to do as God has ordained Certainly, we see the perfection of that followed out in Jesus Christ. So, Genesis, to wrap up. Book of beginnings. Begin, and it, it's the beginning of all kinds of stuff. Remember, Tozier said, the most important verse in the Bible is Genesis 1-1. He said, because if you don't believe that one, you are in big trouble. Where are you going to start believing if you don't believe God created it all? And it is Him with whom we have to do and then now he's a book of beginnings, so you've got the first man created, you've got the world, you've got sin, you've got the curse, you have all those things, but then you have the beginning of the nation of Israel and how God is going to work and move through his chosen people in order to accomplish his goals. And we saw briefly Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and now Joseph. And so we finish Genesis and we move to Exodus, all right? So the book of Exodus, guess what? It picks up about where Genesis leads off. So this is one of those things where it is kind of a chronological tie-in. So if you don't have your Exodus sheet, Cameron's got them in his hands there. Raise your hand if you don't have one. All right, we'll sneak them uh, to you. 
And the book of Exodus we're going to do over this Sunday and next Sunday. It'll take two to get through it. Once I actually start going through, I was like, can't pack it into one. It's too much stuff. So Exodus, first of all, author is Moses. By the way, you're going to hear that from me for Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The Pentateuch, the first five books of the law, all written by Moses. Approximately written 1446 B.C., okay? Give or take. It's close, all right? We know from a, a lot of historical data. The purpose, to tell the story of God's freeing the nation Israel from the bondage of the Egyptians and how he protected and directed them. He, <coughs> he also told them exactly how he wanted to be properly worshipped, all right? So then you see a redemption, righteousness, and restoration outline that is stolen from Warren Wearsby's expository outlines in the Old Testament. And so that is just a good little short. You can hang your uh, hat on and look and say, okay, I want to read some more about that. And it gives you some basic places to go. And I can take the time there, um, but it's for your reference. Next, a comparison with Leviticus, borrowed from H.L. Wilmington's Handbook to the Bible. And Wilmington has this really gift of taking and putting pithy statements and making things connect, which I really like. So notice one of my favorites. I never forget it. Exodus shows how God got his people out of Egypt. Leviticus shows how he tried to get Egypt out of his people. All right, so Exodus is about getting them out. Leviticus is trying to get Egypt out of them. And so we'll see that in two weeks when we do Leviticus. Number two, Exodus relates to Leviticus as the Gospels do to the epistles, the epistles in the New Testament. All right? It tells you how. Number three, Exodus and the Gospels, the manifestation of the Passover lamb occurs in Exodus. In Leviticus and the epistles, the explanation of the Passover lamb. So one is the manifestation, one is the explanation. Number four, Exodus and the Gospels is God's approach to us. Leviticus and the epistles is our approach to God. Number five, in Exodus, God is the Savior. In Leviticus, he is the sanctifier. Meaning, fancy word for he is the one who sets us apart and who makes us holy, when in fact, we're really not, okay? He makes us special because it is by his grace that that occurs. Number six, in Exodus, he spoke from Sinai. In Leviticus, he spoke from the sanctuary. And the, the sanctuary is going to be built at the end of Exodus. We'll see that next week. Number seven, Exodus introduces leaven as one of the two great Old Testament symbols for sin. Leviticus introduces a second such symbol, which is leprosy. So leaven and leprosy are a couple of the pictures that are used for sin. Now, you can't always say that leaven all the time, 100%, is used to illustrate sin. I once heard uh, somebody on radio say that. Can't do that because at one point Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like this. A little bit of leaven, and then it makes, whew, makes stuff grow. So it isn't always a picture of sin, but often it is. All right, so now let's dive into Exodus. And the first point we're going to look at is the history of Israel continues from Genesis. So number one there, the nation is held in Egyptian bondage in chapter 1. And it says this, verse 8, Now a king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Behold, the people of the sons of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come and let us deal wisely with them, or else they will multiply. And in, in the event of war, they will also join themselves to those who hate us, and fight against us, and depart from the land. So they appointed taskmasters over them to afflict them with hard labor. And they built for Pharaoh storage cities, Pithom and Ramses. So here we see the children of Israel, who have been living in the land because... Why? Joseph was there. His brothers and Jacob came down, right? And so they are living, but a new king takes over and goes, oh, these Hebrews are reproducing, and they're growing, and they're getting stronger, and he enslaves them, all right? Puts them into bondage. So that's where we pick up in, in Exodus chapter 1. Things have changed, and now it has become 
a situation where the children of Israel are really under, uh, basically working under slave rule. Number two, God raises up a deliverer in Moses. God raises up a deliverer in Moses. So number eight there, Moses arrives on the scene with weeds, wicker, and water. All right? When he is born, the king of Egypt has said this. He has said, any of those Hebrew boys that are born, you midwives that are helped delivering them, kill them. Kill the baby boys. Because he wanted to stop the growth of the children of Israel. And I make this comment every time I teach this lesson, and I'm going to make it here now. Evil rulers do not value human life. Evil rulers don't care about babies, in the womb or out of the womb. All right? So he was evil. And indeed, every politician that walks the face of the earth that says abortion should be legal is evil. How's that? All right? There is nothing that is more abhorrent to God than taking innocent human life. All right, we're going to see that as we go through the Pentateuch, by the way. We're going to see it over and over and over again. God protects life, all right? Well, the midwives disobeyed Pharaoh in many times, and baby boys were born. Moses is born, put in a basket, and floated in the river, and the daughter of Pharaoh finds the baby, takes it in, and says, oh, look at this cute baby. I'm going to raise this baby. I wonder if there's anybody that could nurse the baby. Meanwhile, Moses' sister says, runs home, tells mom what's happened. And bottom line is mom ends up nursing Moses through the providential hand of God. Moses spends his first 40 years in the palace in Egypt, all right? Trained with the finest of the finest. And he absolutely learns the language. In fact, one reason I believe he is, God is equipping him with his education in his first 40 years is so he can write the Pentateuch the way he wrote it also. All right? Very educated man because they did believe in education. Well, he gets to be about 40 years old. And number B, Moses kills an Egyptian who is abusing Israelis. We see that in chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Now it came about in those days when Moses had grown up, he went out to his brethren and looked on their hard labors, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brothers. So he looked this way and that, and when he saw there was no one around, he struck down the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. All right? So you got the picture. Moses did one of these. And then he proceeded to kill the Egyptian and bury him. All right. Now, one commentator, and I give him credit if I could remember who it was, he said it was always God's intention for Moses to deliver his people from Egypt. It just wasn't his intention to do it one person at a time. That wasn't how God had planned it. But Moses kills this Egyptian in anger. And now, number C, Moses exits into the country to escape the judgment of Pharaoh. Pharaoh is going to judge Moses because... This has become known, and Moses escapes into the country. Now, between my C and D, about 40 years happens. Okay, how's that for a big gap? About 40 years between C and D. So Moses is fleets, fl uh, he fl is runs into the country. There's the word. He runs into the country and hides out on the backside of the desert. And for 40 years, he is tending sheep, working for his father-in-law. He is literally tending sheep. This is a man who for 40, his first 40 years grew up in the palace, eating the finest of the fine, educating himself with the best education that man had to offer. And now his next 40 years, he is with sheep, with goats, kicking rocks, and I think after year two, three, four, five, do you think it ran through his head? Hmm. That was a pretty big mistake I made back there. I think it ran through his head. I wonder if God's going to do anything with me. Year 10, 11, 12. Right? I mean, 40 years, folks. I just don't want you to lose track of the fact that for 40 years, he is in this profession that is underneath 
his training, right? But he is working. There's something to be said for working, even if it isn't always the king's palace that we work for, right? So what happens, number D, Moses encounters the burning bush and receives the I am instruction. Let's look at chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. By the way, Horeb, remember Mount Sinai and Horeb? We're not sure if one's the exact mountain and one's the range, but that is where the law is also going to be given when we look at that here in just a little bit. All right, so understand that's a very important mountain. Number two, the, or verse two, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the, bro, the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place in which you are standing is holy ground. He said also, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then look at verses 13 and 14. Then Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. All right, so we see here that Moses is approached by God in the form of this burning bush to catch his attention. And he speaks to them and he says, I am. In Hebrew, this could also be interpreted, I will be who I will be. Okay? And so what's really interesting is my lost friend, she's a Jewish guy in Israel, and she rejects Jesus as Messiah. But she is very knowledgeable on scripture, like many of the Jewish people who are tru truly following Judaism. And she said, when I studied this in my reading today, because it was their reading, we had this discussion. She said, you know, in Hebrew, I am that I am can also be, I will be who I will be. It's literally, and, and when she said that, I went, hmm, I got to check that out. So sure enough, I went back and did some reading and found commentators and people that know Hebrew much better than I'll ever know it, who said, it can mean exactly that. And the point is, is that I am God, and I need no defending by anybody. I am who I am, all right? And so God is exactly the power behind everything that's going to happen in Scripture. That's why Tozer says in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God, all right? It is, this is a book about God and him reaching out to losers like me and you, all right? In other words, we can't possibly know God except for his gracious revelation to us, all right? So here we see God reveals himself to Moses, and he tells Moses, I want you to go deliver my people, all right? Moses hem haws around, and Moses is like, he's afraid. He says, I can't talk real well. So then Aaron, his brother, is determined. God says, okay, Aaron, you can go and be your mouthpiece, but I'm working through you, all right? And that's how that story goes. Then, where am I? Did I get all the blanks? D, Moses encounters the burning bush and receives the I am instruction. <clears throat> Number E, Moses is given the power of God to release the miracles slash plagues on the land of Egypt. Things like rods becoming snakes, leprosy, water to blood, frogs, gnats, locusts, flies, etc. All right? So Moses is given the power to release those in the presence of Pharaoh on the people in order to get Pharaoh to release the children of Israel to free them from bondage. Okay? Number three, God protects his chosen people from the judgment of the plagues on Egypt. So what we see, number A there, is beginning with flies. So flies, death of cattle, boils, hail, and locust only afflicted the Egyptians. Now think about that. 
Flies were covering the whole land, but in the land of Goshen where the Israelis were hanging out, there was a no-fly zone. All right, there was a no-fly zone in the land of Goshen. Not overhead, but all amongst them. And I'm telling you what, you ever been someplace and there's one fly bothering your food? Okay? And the one reason when people, you know, women have this romantic picnic basket in the blanket, and I'm like, there's flies, there's ants. You've got to be kidding me. Let's eat inside. It's like Jim Gaffigan, the comedian, says, his wife says, don't you like to go camping? And he says, camping? He said, my parents love me, all right? We work hard to have a house, so we don't have to eat outside, all right? So we see here that God protects the children of Israel. So in verse 22 of chapter 8, it gives you, but on that day I will set apart the land of Goshen where my people are living so that no, swarm, no swarms of flies will be there in order that you may know that I am the Lord and in the midst of the land, all right? I will put a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sign will occur. So their cattle died. The Egyptian cattle died, not the Israeli cattle. All right? And so forth. God begins to separate his people from the judgment that he is putting on the balance of the people. Then, number B, I separated this one out separate. It's part of the same conversation, but darkness in the land, except there was light in Israel's home. So one of the plagues is you're going to have complete and utter darkness in the land. All right? The whites lost power last night, right? All right, so when you lose power, it is so disconcerting, all right? And we have stuff like flashlights and candles, right? But it is so disconcerting. And how many of us, we lose power, and we get up to walk to someplace, and out of sheer habit, flip the light switch on in every room as you walk by it. Because we so assume that light will be there. All right? We all hate writing the check to Duke Power, but we sure do like Duke Power service to us. They lost all their light. It goes dark in the land. Except there was light in the children of Israel's houses. Look at 1023. Is that what I put? Hopefully that's right. 1023 says this. Verse 22, so Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days, but all the sons of Israel had light in their dwellings. All right, I think this is pre-incarnate electricity. I don't know if that's proper term, but what I'm saying is this. God allowed light in their homes in the midst of complete darkness. All right? And darkness is terrifying when it is complete darkness. When you put your hand up and you can't see your hand, most of us have never experienced much of that unless you've been in a cave or something like that. And sheer darkness is terrifying. That's one reason Mrs. Stubstead, my third grade teacher, she would read classic books to us after we ate and after recess in order to make us want to read. And one of the books she read was Little Timmy Picks Up a Firecracker, lights it, but the fuse is shorter on that one. As he gets ready to throw it, it explodes, and he goes blind. Now, Mrs. Stubson was doing her devious little way to make sure that little boys like me and other little boys were afraid of firecrackers, and I never would pick one up and throw it because I didn't want to be blind like Timmy, all right? Because the rest of the book was Timmy functioning as a blind person. Oh, man, I didn't want to lose my sight, all right? Terrified of being blind even to this day, all right? Uh, I'd like to give up all my other sights before I give that one up. They had utter darkness, but God gave light in their homes. Number C, the final plague. The final plague is death of the firstborn son. In brackets there, the Passover. Passover. So chapters 11 and 12 talk about it. Now, real quickly, God said this. You're going to take a lamb. You are going to sacrifice this lamb. But here's how it's going to happen. You're going to take the lamb into your home on the 10th day of the month. And you read the instruction. You check me out. Bring it down to the 10th day of the month. Those of you that have children or grandchildren, if you bring an animal into the home on the 10th day, they begin to pet the sweet little lamb. On the 11th day, they're having tea or they're playing cowboy and Indian with the little lamb. They have named the lamb. The 12th day, they are sleeping with the lamb. They are, the lamb becomes part of the family, 
And on day 14, 10th that comes in, 14th, you're to slit the lamb's throat and sacrifice it. Guess what? We are illustrating to our children the fact that when God says we do something, we do it, and there's a penalty, and the penalty of death is because we have sinned. All right? We are going to see the Passover be instituted here even in advance of the actual act happening. God institutes it for the children of Israel before he ever does the first one because he is sovereign. He knows what's going to happen today. All right? he doesn't, he's not surprised by anything that will happen today. He knows every word that will be said and the response that we will have to such. So the blanks. Provision was made, number one, to escape this coming judgment with human responsibility added. This is interesting to me. All the other plagues that we talked about where he separated everyone from the children of Israel is like, children of Israel, you're not getting flies and boils and the death of cattle and so forth. It wasn't affecting them. Darkness didn't hit them. They had light in their house. But this one, there is a human responsibility added. And the human responsibility was... You're going to kill the lamb, and you're going to put the blood over the doorposts. I just find it interesting because salvation is God's work, and yet he combines this with some human responsibility, and Passover pictures that. When we take the look at it today, when we offer the good news of the gospel, the good news of the gospel is as God graciously reaches down to dead people, slaps you, grabs you, wakes you up, and... Your response is to be repentance and faith. It's to follow him as he is prescribed. And that is instituted here actually with Passover. All right? If you're a follower of Christ today, it's not because you're smarter than anybody else. It's because a gracious God took a dead person and made them alive. Right? All right, so provision is made to escape it. Number two, the Passover lamb was to be sacrificed and blood placed on the doorposts of each house. Number three, God instituted the remembrance of the event before he did it the first time. All right, he really does institute it before he does the first one. He says, this is what you're going to do. And then proceeded then to have the first Passover occur. Now what happens is, and no blank there, but the children of Israel do as instructed. And the angel of death passes over the land of Egypt. And the firstborn son of all of the Egyptians is dead in their bed. Okay? Folks, again, the emotion of Scripture, you have to read it and, and get into and think about, can you imagine the wailing and the outcry as people went to wake up their children and to feed them and the oldest son was dead? All right? Not just one, but tens of thousands. Brutal. Okay, brutal. But here's what I know. I know that God is just in how he carries out his judgment and his sacrifice and his grace and his mercy. And the fact is, again, with this unbelievably difficult activity, God's just, folks. He is just. Don't ever think he's not just. There isn't a single one of us that if we drop dead in the next minute could say God was not justified in taking us out. How's that? In fact, the only reason I stand before you is because God has graciously let my heart pump and my lungs work yet another minute. I don't deserve it. All right? So what happens now? Number four, God provides for his chosen people in their exit. God provides for his chosen people in their exit. When, the, when this plague occurs and the death of the firstborn son, you know what the Egyptians said? Get out. Go. Leave. All right. At this point, the Egyptian people, I'm convinced they didn't care what Pharaoh said. In other words, just go. All right. But here's a really interesting point. Number A there, gold, silver, and clothing finance their flight as the Egyptians are willingly plundered. Look at chapter 12, verse 35. God had told them, the children of Israel, and told Moses that they were going to plunder the Egyptians. Look at verse 35. It says, Now the sons of Israel had done according to the word of Moses. This is following the Passover. For they had requested from the Egyptians articles of silver, articles of gold, and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they let them have their request. 
Thus they plundered the Egyptians. So literally the children of Israel went to their slave masters and said, look, we are going to leave like you want us to. <laughs> and see how this is turned? We're going to leave, but we're going to need some, we need some help. We need some of that gold, silver, and can we have some clothes? You know what they did? They said, here. Okay? And one thing we know is this. When you get to the point when your life is on the line, you don't much care about hanging on to uh, some trinkets and some baubles and so forth. Ask the wealthy guy who's got cancer if he'd give up $10 million if he could be cancer free. You know what he'd say? He'd take all $100 million if he had it. It's amazing what becomes important when your life's on the line. They said, here, take the stuff. They willingly hand over all their stuff. Now, I want to point out that the, this silver, this gold, and the clothing, the children of Israel are going to be using in their flight because we're going to see as they go through various nations, at times they tell a king, you're going to have to pay, we are going to pass through your land, but we are going to pay for what we eat, what we drink, and anything we consume. You know how they paid for it? With what they got by God's gracious provision from Egypt. Now, I, I'll come back to the blanks. I've got to finish my thought. Later, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be born. And guess what? Magi from the east are going to come to worship this one. And they come and remember what they do? They give gold, frankincense, and myrrh. All three valuable items. They hand them to Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus. And then what happens, it's a reverse of this, is God instructs Moses, you need to get out because the king is looking to kill the baby. Again, evil kings, they don't care if the baby's alive or dead even. Okay, In other words, they don't care. They just want this kid eliminated to the point where he's going to kill every kid two years old and under, every boy two years old and under. So you want a connection to Moses and Jesus? Both of them had evil kings that wanted them dead as babies. Okay? Moses and Jesus both have that in very common uh, thread. So what happens is they head to Egypt, and Mary and Joseph, were they wealthy? Uh-uh. But you know what they have? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh in order to finance their trip, pay people with it, and be able to survive. God graciously provides for his children, no matter which way, coming or going. All right? And then, did I miss a blank? Gold, silver, and clothing finance their flight as the Egyptians are plundered. God will one day provide for Joseph and Mary's flight with the baby Jesus to Egypt from the Magi's gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And then, let's conclude with this one, number B. The Lord provides direction with a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. So, how do the children of Israel know where to go? God has his big tall to the heavens like a pillar that's a big fireball if it's dark and it's a cloud by day all right and the reason it would have had to be like that is don't forget we're told that there's 600,000 men of Israel when they when they exit Egypt so if you go to the Panther Stadium and there's like 80,000 people there I think it's approximately what the place holds that seems like a pretty good crowd of people and it really seems like a pretty good crowd when you try and get out of downtown Charlotte, you know, with 80,000 people. Think about it, 600,000 men plus women and children. And don't forget, Pharaoh was greatly disturbed by how many of them there were. So we're talking a million and a half, two million people. So we're talking a big group of people that God's got to move. You know, the flannel graphs, if you grew up in church like I did, the flannel graphs show like 12 people following a pillar of cloud because that's all the flannel graph can hold. It's just the little teeny, because you can't put two million on two. God graciously provides direction, and that direction is always going to be there for them. Folks, i got to tell you something. God has graciously preserved his word. It is indeed our pillar of cloud and our pillar of fire. He has told us where to go and how to approach him. All right? This is the book that we need to keep before us. So when we get to Deuteronomy and we get to the Shema, where it says there's one God, all right? And you should always have him before you. We're going to talk some more about the importance of this, but God has given us direction just like he did the children of Israel. And the direction is found in this book. That's why in this church... 
the direction is we want to sing, we want to pray, we want to teach, we want to preach out of this book. It is literally the word of God to us. It is the direction that we have. Anything else is substandard and ought to be discarded as just false. All right? This is the word of an almighty God. Let's close in prayer. Father God, I thank you for the opportunity to worship you this morning. Lord, I'm thankful that you can deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt. And Lord, you can also deliver anybody here out of their sin that holds them today. Lord, I thank you for the fact that you are still the uh, Redeemer. You are still the Passover Lamb that satisfies God's wrath. Lord, I'm thankful you raised up the ultimate Deliverer in Jesus Christ, who's the perfect Moses that was to come. And Lord, I pray that if there's any here that have just not fully understood the good news that you have paid the price for our sin, that they'll understand today, repent, and put their faith and trust in him. Lord, for those of us who claim Christ, may you help us to live like uh, the, ch the children of the King that he has graciously made us. Lord, I ask that you bless the service to follow as we sing and as we fellowship and as we worship in the word. May you help us to be receptive to the Spirit's working in our hearts and lives. May you help Clint to deliver the word accurately and with passion. And Lord, we pray that you bless us for having been here. And Lord, we pray that the, uh, the aroma of our praise will be acceptable in your sight today. We ask these things.